All right. Well, as many of you know, we've uh, been going through this series on, uh, on reach. It's just very simply reaching people in our community. And uh, several weeks ago, I, I did something a little unconventional. I gave you the outline to the next seven weeks of messages. And uh, I want you to know that I have to stick with that now that I've said it, right? And so, uh, so I'm thankful, though, as I, uh, as I began to prepare for this series many, 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 many weeks ago, uh, I had kind of a, a skeletal kind of an architecture to it. And I said, this is, I think, the direction I want to go. And, I, and the reason why I shared the outline with you is I want you to know where I'm going to, right? And so here's some... Uh, here are some things that we'll be talking about. First of all, point one, we dealt with, uh, we're dealing with the man. First of all, the man, the person. As we begin to reach people with the gospel, there's some things that, uh, there's some preparations that I need to go through, right? Uh, it's been said that God has to work on you before he can work through you. God must work on you before he can work through you. So, Kind of this uh, part one is dealing with that. How is God going to work on us individually to reach others? Uh, I begin by talking about having a clear head, a clear head. Today, I'm talking about having a caring heart. Next week, I'm talking about having clean hands. All of these things are, are kind of preparations that we need to do as we deal with the man. The second part is dealing with the mission, the mission, and of course we know the mission, reaching people, is the great commission, right? Uh, Matthew 28, it's go unto all nations, baptizing them, right? We preaching the gospel, baptizing, making disciples, right? That is the great commission. So we're going to be talking about that in part two, and part three is dealing with the method. How do we go about doing this? So we're talking about the man, the mission, and then the method. So this morning, we're in part two, having a caring heart, having a caring heart. And can I just say by way of introduction that a lot of reaching people with the gospel has to do with caring for them. Now, I, I, I'm sure that there are other ways that maybe we could go out and, and maybe persuasively talk people into believing the way we believe. I, I'm sure maybe uh, through reasons of of guilt or, or, or maybe embarrassment or, or whatnot, we might go reach people. And I've said before that a heathen, God-hating atheist can preach the Bible and people can respond in faith because it's the power of God's Word that saves, right? But we have to be prepared spiritually for this sort of thing. We have to, be, we have to prepare ourselves, and as we prepare ourselves, we must have a caring heart toward people, because there's, there's really no greater way to influence people than to care about them, right? I don't know how many times we've, uh, we've maybe done something and not cared for a person, and then uh, with, with very little result, and then we, we begin to care for somebody and then have great result. And so we have to have a caring heart. We have to love them. One famous quote that we would all do good to remember was from Theodore Roosevelt, who said, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. I tell you, some of the greatest uh, influences in my life have been by people who have just cared for me. It's not by people who had just a tremendous wealth of knowledge, but people who had a tremendous wealth of love. They cared for me. They were concerned for me. They had compassion for me. And I'm going to use those three words interchangeably throughout this message. Concern, compassion, and caring. We have to have concern. We have to have care, compassion for one another. John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now, there's not enough love going around, that's for sure. And uh, I appreciate so much this church. I appreciate the, the, the kindness and the, the friendliness, the hospitality of this church, that we can love one another. But when you get outside these walls, can I just tell you, friends, that there's just not enough love out there. Romans 12.10 says this, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor 
preferring one another. In honor, preferring one another. That's a, uh, a selfless a selfless act, preferring one another. In honor, preferring other people. It's, it's, it's essentially taking other people and putting them before you. And I, and I tell you what, there, there is so much selfishness in this world today. And it just seems always even getting more and more pervasive. And, and you, uh, you drive down the road and you go to the checkout counter. And, and I don't know how many of you guys have done this. And, and you're standing there. Or you're maybe standing at, the, at uh, let's say, Chick-fil-A or something like that. And, and you're just waiting to, to order. And, and uh, they're always busy. It's just pandemonium, you know. And, and you're waiting and uh, someone just kind of cuts in line just as you're ready to take your, your step forward. And you kind of look over and you thought, they knew I was standing here. And you say, you know, it's okay. It's okay. They may be selfish, but I'm going to be selfless. And I'm going to let them go in honor, preferring one another. We need to be kindly affectioned one to another. Can you imagine how the world would be with a bunch of Christians that just cared about other people more than themselves? I, I, I can kind of imagine kind of a utopia. Kind of this, uh, this paradise, if you will, of, of, of people who just love one another. In honor, they're preferring one another. They're always putting other people first. I can imagine that. And one day we'll get there. When we're with the Lord, we'll get there. 1 Corinthians 10, 24 says, Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. That does not mean riches. That means well-being. Seeking someone else's well-being over ours because... Oftentimes, we are selfish. So we need to be selfless. And when it comes to having a caring heart, we have to care about people more than we care about ourselves. Now, that can be really tough because I tell you what the world tells us. The world tells us, go out there and get your own, right? You got you to gotta get your way to the top. You got you to gotta go out there and just take hold. And it's always about just, it's kind of cutthroat out there, isn't it? You know, as opposed to saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to, in honor, prefer other people. I'm going to seek another man's well-being over myself, and I'm going to love one another. I'm going to love one another. I have to have a caring heart. One commentator said, we are to seek the welfare of the other man. And I don't know how often we do that, but it's probably not often enough. So here are four groups Four groups. There are three in your verse sheet this morning, but there is a fourth. Four groups that we should have a caring heart towards. Now, I could have taken this message in just a variety of different directions, but I just wanted to kind of sum up four groups. First of all, we need to care about those that are astray. We need to care about those that are astray. This deals with those that are not saved, that are not going to heaven when they die. When I use the word saved, I mean that they're not saved from hell going to heaven. They're not saved. They're lost. And we have to care about those people. And now, of course, this is kind of the, the overarching thesis of, of, the, of the entire series of reach, right? It's caring for the lost people. Matthew 9, 35 and 36 says this, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogue and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, watch this, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as a sheep having no shepherd. Here we see Jesus had compassion on those people who were astray. And so we ought also to have compassion on those people that are astray. I think there are a whole lot more people going astray than what we would like to think. We would like to think that because people are on the same road, they have the same destination. But can I tell you, friends, this morning that just because people are in this church, just because people go to church in the Quad Cities, just because we have a, a church as a whole and we are a quote-unquote Christian nation, does not mean that everybody is going to heaven when they die. A lot more people are going astray than what we would like to admit. I read a statistic, 6,316 people die every hour. How many of those people do you think are actually going to heaven when they die? Do you think all of them? Friends, that's just not true. I wish they all would. 
But the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. They all could go if they responded by faith. But not everybody's going to heaven when they die. There's a lot of lost people out there. I think you just look around our community and you just, you just drive down the road. I, I know uh, you, you go to a, a baseball game. I've only been to one down here at the Bandit Stadium. I've only been to one, but you just look out in the crowds and you just wonder how many people are actually going to heaven. You drive down the road. You see big political rallies. You see all of these activities that gather thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And you have to ask yourselves, how many people are actually saved versus how many people are lost. It's a terrible thing to be lost, isn't it? John Newton nailed it in 1772 when he wrote, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I say this morning, friends, that it is a terrible thing to be lost. And when you know people who are lost, you guys remember the story when Brooks was here, he was lost in a cave. And he says, uh, I can't remember how the story went. I wish Landon was here to tell it. But he says, I was lost. I was just a little boy. And, and he says, uh, I, I, I don't know if he had a flashlight or something, but the batteries died. Do you remember the story? Anyway, he got lost and, and he was panicking. He was lost, terrified. And he said the, 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 the only thing that gave him peace is when he heard his dad hollering for him. He was lost, but then he was found. And can I say this morning that there are a lot of lost people, and we have to care about those people who are astray. Care about them, because there's a lot of them. Secondly, secondly, we need to care about those that are abased. Care about those that are abased. This deals with those that are, are not wealthy. And I have to say that there are a lot of not wealthy people in the world. Uh, the, the most wealthy people make up the 1%, remember? So there's tell, you're telling me there's 99% that don't compare to the 1%. There's a lot of people who are abased, who just don't have what we have, and we need to care about them. Now, I have to say this, that there are those people who have a lot, worked very hard for their money, a lot of them. Some of them inherited it, and their parents worked hard for it. Maybe the, maybe the kids squander it, who knows? But we need to take care. We need to help those people who are not able to necessarily take care of themselves. Now, there are a lot of people, two panhandlers. We see these people on the side of the road. We see the people, and, and, and I know some of them. And uh, they, they stand there, and they have a sign. And, 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 and I hope you pity those folks. I hope you pity them. Now, some of them there are there because of their own irresponsibility, and they don't want to have a job. They don't want to have responsibility, and they are there purposefully. But there are a lot of poor people, and maybe not poor quite like that, maybe not poor minimum wage like that, and I think that they actually make better than minimum wage. I read a report a while ago that says somewhere between 40 and 60 or 40 and $80 a day is what they make, times 50 weeks a year. They're 52, but even, I guess, homeless people need to have a vacation. So, so let's just say 50 weeks a year, that's 260 days roughly or so, and then you, you base, they, they make more than minimum wage. And they do that by choice. Now, I'm not here to pick on them. What I'm here to simply say is that, is that we need to take care of the poor. Mark 14, 7, it's just an interesting story. It's an interesting story about a woman who came to Bethany and had an alabaster box full of precious ointment. And when she came, she broke this alabaster's box and anointed the head of Jesus. And there was a group of disciples that were with him and said, but, uh, but Lord, this is wasteful. This money, could have, this, this ointment could have been sold and the money given to the poor. And that's true. Now, in its context, this, this is supporting the fact that worship of Jesus was, was okay, okay? That, that's what this context is. But he makes an interesting statement in 14.7, and he says this, For ye have the poor with you always. You know what that means? We have a lot of work to do, don't we? We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of, a lot of people that we, that we can help. And as opposed to helping poor people, you know what we end up doing? We end up oppressing them. Now, we don't, we don't create a society that oppresses them. They, they allow themselves, in a sense, to be oppressed. But we don't oppress them. Proverbs 14, 31 says, He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth his maker. 
Proverbs 14, 20, 21 says, The poor is hated even of his own neighbor. The poor is hated even of his own neighbor. Now that gets me. I don't know how many of you know your neighbors. I tell you, I just, this is a horrible tragedy, but uh, we don't know our neighbors like we used to know them. And if I was to go around this room and say, I want the first and last name of your neighbor to the left of you and to the right of you, you would probably be like, not exactly sure. You could tell me all of the things that they do that you don't like, right? But <laughs> you couldn't tell me their name. I know we got a neighbor who lives across from us. Lord love him. But man, he plays his music at the just the strangest hours. I, I think his name is John, I think. But I, I, you know what? I don't know. Listen to verse 21. He that despises, despiseth his neighbor sinneth. But he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. Now, that word happy is the word blessed. Blessed are you if you have mercy on the poor. Now, I think we would all do really well to remember that these poor people could be any one of us. We could be any one of them. You realize that, right? And you might say, well, pastor, you know, I've worked really, really hard. And, and, and I'm just, I have never been one to sit around, and I'm just not lazy. And, and I've, got, I've got my health for me, and God could take it that fast. You know, you could be out there, too. You could be poor. Well, but, 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 but you, know, you know, pastor, I, I, I've stored up some treasure because I've been faithful, and God could take it that fast. Matter of fact, we saw that in 2006, 2007, 2008. People who had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, gone. It's not that they didn't work hard for it. It's not that they weren't responsible. We could be any one of them. Luke 12 is an interesting story. I love this exam. I, lo I love this this uh, this record, and uh, it, it somewhat pertains to this. And and the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, "What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruit." So he had a, he had a he had a uh, uh, a warehousing problem. He had so much stuff he didn't have any place to put it. In verse 18, and he said. This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And you say, well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that I'm going to die, but you could be like this guy. Look at what happened to him. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be that thou hast provided? Who are they going to be then? You could be rich, and then you could be dead. You could be rich, and then you could be poor. And we need to look out and help those folks that are poor. John 3, 17, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? If you have accumulated a lot, and you just say, hey, 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 I see you have need, but you know what? I, 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 just, I just really don't want to help this person over here. You don't have a caring heart for this person. But in order to reach this person, you realize you have to have a caring heart. You realize that you have to have a caring heart towards those that are astray and those that are abased. Those that are lost and those that don't have what you have. We have to have a heart of compassion, of concern, and care for them because we could be any one of them. And let me say this too. Proverbs 21, 13 is great. Whoso stoppeth his ears at the crying of the poor. This is wonderful. He also shall cry himself and shall not be heard. Don't stop up your ears for their crying, because that could be one of us. Thirdly, we need to care about those who are apostate. So we need to care about those who are astray, care about those who are abased, and care about those who are apostate. This deals with those that are not orthodox in their theology. Maybe they, they disagree 
theologically. Now, I'm not saying for the sake of everything, just get along with everybody and and go ahead and believe everything that everybody believes. What I'm saying is that we don't have to go against them. We have to have compassion on them. We should care about those people that don't believe the same thing as we believe. Honestly, friends, who's left? I mean, really, if, if, if I expect everybody to believe what, what I believe, I'm not going to get along with anybody. So we have to care about them. We have to be concerned about them. We have to have a caring heart. If we want to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, we have to care about those people, even the apostates. Jude talked about this, talked about having compassion on them. He was going to write about salvation. The first few verses, he says, but, but he says, uh, I found it needful to write unto you to earnestly contend for the faith. He says, I was going to write unto you about common salvation, but instead, I'm talking to you about contending for what it is you believe in. But he gets down to verse 22 and 23, and he says this about those apostates. You know, I got, I got to love this. You got to love this. He says this, verse 22, and of some have compassion making a difference. That word making a difference just, uh, 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 just, just simply means to make a distinction because there are different groups of apostasy, which he covered. And he says, and if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Have compassion on them. Now, here's this is really hard to do, is to have mercy on people who have who have gone into apostasy. Have mercy on those people who have gone into apostasy. Have compassion on those that don't believe the same thing we do. You know the first thing that we do as Christians is we're we're really quick to criticize. We're really quick just to cut someone down, aren't we? Someone doesn't believe the same thing, and bang! Man, I tell you, that guy, he's way off the rocker. We do this in in religion, don't we? Now, I could attack all sorts of religions. I could. It would be very unbecoming of me, though. I could attack Mormons, and I could attack the the Roman Catholic Church, and and I could attack all sorts of other people who believe something different than I do. But what good is that going to do? Am I really going to reach them with the gospel? I'm not going to reach them. They're going to look at me and say, look at this idiot. Who is this guy anyway? Well, just because everybody's not an independent Baptist doesn't mean, that, doesn't mean that we have to go out and just criticize everybody either. We do this on the political front. It's so easy to just, to just, uh, just to attack people that don't believe the same thing as we believe. Now, you all know that, that I, get, I, get, I have my political viewpoints, but, and, and, and I am so pro-life, but I'm not going to go out there and attack people who are having abortions either. Because that's not going to win them to Christ, is it? Am I going to go out there and attack uh, all of the, the entire homosexual community? That's not going to win them to Christ. Do I disagree? Yes, I disagree. But I have to have a caring heart for them. And I have to love them. I have to love them even if they don't believe what I believe. And the last thing that I'm going to do is go out there and just criticize him. I remember, I've mentioned this before, uh, when, when, when Ben was just young, I had my, he's young now, how old are you? You're 13, he'd be 14, just so you know, and uh, in 30 days. He told me that. He said, Dad, I'm going to be 14 in 30 days. Josh comes up, he says, I'm going to be 13 in 18 days. Yeah, see, I know this. See, I do listen, don't I, sometimes. Okay, where was I going? So I had this uh, picture, and it was uh, President Barack Obama, and he was, he was on my phone, and I remember Ben was maybe four years old, and he points down, and he says, Dad, is that a bad man? I said, Son, that's the President of the United States of America. Do I disagree with him? Absolutely. Do I disagree with a lot of policies that he had? Absolutely. But how am I going to win them if I'm always cutting them down? I have to have a caring heart for them. I have to love these people, Ephesians 4, 14 to 15, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lay and wait to deceive. 
Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. Boy, there's not enough of that, is there? Do I have to agree with everybody? No. Do I have to love them? You better believe it. You better believe it. And we have to have a caring heart toward people if we're going to reach them. If we don't have a caring heart, we're never going to reach people. We're never going to reach them with the gospel to care for them. This other group he was referring to is rescuing them from fire, rescuing them as if they were perishing, as if they were being burned. And, and it, says, it says this in, in, uh, in Jude 23, do it with fear. And others save with fear. Save them with fear. That, you know what that means? That means be concerned that you don't be contaminated by what they're contaminated with. Because you could be burned up too. It's amazing that we could be astray. Matter of fact, we once were lost, but now we're found. You didn't have all of the riches that you have now. Uh, you didn't have them 20, 30 years ago. Right? You were once abased. You were once astray. And can I just tell you that you once didn't believe what you believe today, so you were kind of an apostate yourself. We risk potentially being contaminated by what they are contaminated with. Now, the laborer of the Lord must love one another. We must love one another also. Fourthly, it's not on your list, but we must care about those who are afflicted. Those who are afflicted. Not just the apostates and the abased and the astray, but also the afflicted. This deals with those that are in trouble. And you know, sometimes you just need someone to put their arm around you. You know what I mean? Sometimes you just need someone just to love on you and just to say, hey, man, I'm here with you. I'm here with you. I'm for you. I love you. You might not agree with them. They might be broke and they might be lost. But man, just sometimes put your arm around them and just say, I know, I, I don't understand what you're going through. I know what you're going through. But I don't understand it. I'm here for you. The, the righteous people are afflicted. Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Can you imagine the afflictions of the unrighteous who do not have the hope that we have? We have a tremendous hope. We have a peace of God that, that passes all understanding. We go to God and we say, Lord, we got this. No, forget that. You got this. I don't got anything. I got me a whole ball of trouble. And I got you. Lord, so thank you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Man, I can't just imagine all of the afflictions you had when you were astray. 1 Peter 3, 8, finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. And we need to not just love the brethren, but love as brethren, right? Right? Galatians says, do good to all men, especially to them of the household of faith. It's amazing how many people just do good to the household of faith, but not to all men. It says, do good to all men, especially them of the household of faith. And we need to do good to them, and we need to love them, and we need to have concern for them and compassion on them, even in their afflictions. Because once we were like that, that we just wish someone just put their arm around us and loved us. And in conclusion, I want to say this, be grateful, be grateful that the Lord has had compassion on you. Be Lord, be, be, be Lord, be thankful that God hasn't consumed you with fire. Lamentations 3.22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. God is merciful to us, isn't he? And I tell you, you cannot reach a community with the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ if you do not have a caring heart. You can't reach him if you don't have a clear head either. We talked about that last week, having the right perspective, having the right perspective Life is short, death is certain, heaven and hell are real, the lost must be found, those were the three points. We have to have a clear head, now we have to have a caring heart. 
we're not going to really be effective any other way. So many people try all sorts of tactics and things, but nothing works like love. How many times do you just wish someone just, just put their arm around you and say, man, I love you. Man, brother, sister, I just absolutely just love you. And they just need an encouraging word. And, and the first thing we do is, oh, they're, they're broke. They're the poor. They're astray. They're apostate. They're afflicted. I can't help them. Sometimes it's just, man, I love you. God loves you too. We could be in their shoes. I thank God. I thank God that he saved us. I thank God that I know where I'm going when I die. And if you're here today, friends, and you don't know where you're going, you might have come into church this morning and you said, I don't even know, I don't even know anything about heaven. I don't know where I'm going when I die. Some of you may have come into church and say, well, I'm here, I'm here in church hoping that one day I'll get to heaven because I'm in church. And can I tell you, friends, that that's not how you get to heaven. I had a baptism this morning. That's not how you get to heaven. Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's the gospel that's the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, not is baptized, not walks an aisle, not raises their hand, not gives money to the church. I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that we all have sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone in this room has done something wrong, and that sin must be paid for. You know that? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's the payment that must be paid is death. The payment is not water baptism. The wages of sin is not church membership. It's not church attendance. It's not being an encouraging soul to those people out there. The wages of sin is death. Someone had to die. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for your sin. That's right. He didn't come to this earth to go to church because church membership is the wage of sin. He didn't come to give money. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He wanted to save people. He went out reaching for people and sharing with them the good news that Jesus Christ, that he came in the flesh for their sin. He came to make the payment for them because the wages of sin is death. I want this hand right here to represent the Lord Jesus 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for our sin. Once you were lost, but now you're saved. How does that transaction happen between your sin and Jesus making the payment for that sin? The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Isn't that neat? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. So it's nothing that you do. It's something that Jesus Christ has done. He came to the cross to die on the cross, to make the payment with the cross. He died for our sin. And through simple faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, we can go to heaven. It's when we believe that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day. That's the picture of baptism. Baptism doesn't save you. Baptism doesn't save anybody, but it shows the death going into the water, the burial, and the resurrection and newness of life. Even Jesus was baptized. Jesus didn't get baptized to get saved. Isn't it wonderful that we can just simply, in the quietness of our own, of our own mind, believe that Jesus died and have eternal life? A lot of people say, well, you just, just turn over a new leaf. The problem is, is the wages of sin is death, not turning over a new leaf. The wages of sin is death. It's, it's, uh, it's not being good or, or doing things. This sin has to be paid for, and it's when you trust Jesus Christ that he made the payment for you. Now, we take that message, we take that message, and then we, we share that message with other people that we love, loving one another, in honor preferring one another, right? That's the message we have to take home that we have salvation because what Jesus did for me, not what I do for him. And then we take that message to others because we love them. We love those folks that are astray. We love the ones that are abased, apostate, and afflicted. 
I thank God for that. 